Good morning, it's Wednesday morning. We are in Acts chapter 20. We're going to read the whole chapter and focus most of our attention on the second half. Um, partly that's because the first bit is travel plans. The second bit is about someone who preaches too long, and I always get criticised for this. But on this occasion, Paul preaches so long uh, that Iticus falls out of the window dead. Um, and then, incredibly, Paul uh, raises that young man back to life again. He goes home alive, and people are greatly comforted. And you'd have to say, well, of course they are. And uh, many have used this as a passage to tell preachers to preach less. However, after this event takes place, Paul continues to preach the whole night through because one of the things you discover in Acts chapter 20 is the importance of the Word of God. In fact, so important that Paul says it is the absolute basis for his ministry. Because in the second half of this chapter, he calls the Ephesian elders to come and meet him as he travels by in order to say farewell to them for the last time. And it's an incredibly emotional passage. In fact, so emotional that this passage is drenched with tears. On three occasions, people are crying. And you'd have to assume that people were crying more than that when Idicus fell out of the broom. We see Paul exhibiting exactly the same qualities that you see in Jesus. I mean, this reflects back, doesn't it, onto the life of Jesus when something like Jairus' daughter is raised or the, the widow's son or even Lazarus. Here we see again the very thing that Jesus says, that his apostles will go about and do the very thing that he did. Just as he went about proclaiming the word of God, he goes about also raising the dead. And here this young man raised back to life. We see the power of the apostolic word. So powerful that Paul will go on to the church in Ephesus or to the leaders there and tell them just how that had been primary in his ministry. And that's really what I want us to focus on this morning. Because what Paul does is he looks back with that group of elders and says, this is what my ministry amongst you looked like. You see that in verses 18 through down to verses 21. And he says, at the heart of that, in fact, with great humility and with tears, I endured all that came, but I didn't hesitate to preach to you the gospel. Verse 20, you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and house to house. I have declared to both the Jew and to the Greek that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. Paul understands what is at the heart of the Christian message. And it's a message of proclamation. It's a message that calls people, regardless of their background, to repent and place their faith in Jesus. That same message, he says, is going to continue with him in the next phase of his ministry. And it's the message that he's passing on to these elders to be at the bedrock of the ministry there in Ephesus. And it's to continue on, in fact, for all of God's people that constantly wear about that same thing, holding fast to the word of God, despite the persecutions that come and calling people to repentance and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Then in verses 22 and 20 down to 24, he goes on and says, this is what is going to happen to me as I move forward. And when you look at what happens, he's going to keep in step with the word and with the spirit moving forward. He's going off to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen, but only knowing actually that persecution will be facing him in those places. And yet, what will be at the bedrock of his ministry? The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. He will not stop proclaiming and testifying. And then in verses 25 and following, he now gets them to look forward. And he says to them, I haven't hesitated as I've come preaching the kingdom, but you're not going to see me again. Therefore, he says to them in verse 28, keep watch. Well, why? Keep watch because persecutions and opposition will come. He actually tells them that you've been equipped with a task from the very Holy Spirit to be overseers. And part of your task as an overseer or an elder or as a shepherd is to keep watch. And you just think about how important that task is of keeping watch if you're a shepherd. The threats that come. To stand at the gate it picks up that image in Ezekiel in the Old Testament of the overseers of God's people who stood on the city wall, keeping watch to see if some marauding army was attacking, was advancing before them, and they were to guard and defend against it. Now, the same is true now. That task of keeping watch, of guarding the good deposit because savage wolves will come. In fact, even those from within their own number will rise up and distort the truth and draw people away. 
Such is the temptation of this world, such is the impact of the devil, such is the influence of sinful people at work, that the task remains to keep watch. And Paul tells them that this is something that they need to be warned again and again about, so much so that he ends this little section in verse 31 by saying, So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. See, not only did he have tears back in verse 19 when he served them with great humility and with tears, now he warns them in verse 31 with tears that they be on their guard because that flock is precious and the word of God coming to that flock is precious. And I, I'd invite you to think about what it means for us in our context to, to guard the good deposit that we have been given. One of the things I'm thankful for for us as a church at Narrabeen is the focus that we have on guarding God's word and seeing it continually proclaimed. Please pray for us and pray for this church that we will always be committed to that. And of course, that's what Paul commits this church to as they continue on, that they wouldn't be distracted, but that they would be committed to God and to his word. Have a look at verse 32. He says, now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. That is the kind of confidence that we have in God's word. The thing that we can trust when we don't have the answers, when we don't know which way to go. God's word is the word that sustains us. In the midst of our sufferings and our joy, we turn to God's word to guide us. And in all of this, Paul says to them, you realize that in doing what I've done in the model of my ministry, I didn't serve myself, I served others. In fact, I was picking up on the very teaching that Jesus, the word made flesh, made known to us. That is, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And his giving was about the giving of himself in the giving of God's word. And so today, as we think about how we might give of ourselves, what part does the sharing of God's word have in your life and as you share that into the lives of others? I want to encourage you to think about a way that you might take God's word and invest it into someone else today. Tell them something from God's word that might indeed build them up or instruct them. And notice when this passage finishes that once again, now everyone is crying. All of them wept and embraced and Paul and kissed him. And what grieves them most is the fracture in the relationship that's going to happen. So important has his ministry been to them that they're grieved at the thought that it won't continue. But he leaves them knowing that he has given them everything that they need because they have the Holy Spirit guiding them through God's word. And the truth of that is no less true for us today. So as we move into our day, we aren't ill-equipped. In fact, we have God's very word guiding us and his Holy Spirit indwelling us. And with that, we have been blessed with every possible spiritual blessing. So let's give thanks to God today. Let's pray in Jesus' name. Gracious Heavenly Father, we see a passage here full of emotion, full of tears as Paul reflects upon his ministry as he serves them uh, from this heartfelt conviction that they need to know you and that they know you through your word and through the indwelling of your spirit. And as he leaves them, he implores them with tears that they do not drift away, that they would indeed keep watch, that shepherds would guard the church of God. And we pray, Lord, that the same would be true today. Lord, guard us against those things that would threaten to distract us or destroy us. But we thank you that you preserve your church and that you love it. So would you continue to guide us? And Heavenly Father, we pray that we would indeed know that it is better to give. It's more blessed to give what we have received than to think that believing and trusting in you is about acquiring for ourselves. So Heavenly Father, like Paul, help us to be servant leaders, shepherds who give of ourselves. And we ask, Lord, for an opportunity today to take your word and invest it into the life of others, knowing that it is the thing that can build us up and give us an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. And for this, we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.